Thank you. Well, so yeah, 40 minutes because uh, Blaise has cancelled his talk. We kind of arranged this so that uh, we have interesting things to say until the end. So I'm Adrian. I'm a Montreal Python member. Um, I've been doing Python for the last five years. I'm really happy with this. We both work for Ludia. Ludia is a gaming company based in Montreal. We do mobile and web games ba uh, based on uh, really known brands such as uh, Where is Waldo and Jurassic Park. And this is screensaver, Apple stuff. And uh, also uh, Jurassic Park, uh, we even have TV, uh, TV shows such as The Press is Right. <clears throat> yes, there is a video game based on The Press is Right. We have nearly 2 million people playing daily to our, ga to our games on different platforms, uh, mobile and web. And in the last four years, we developed uh, 10 pyramid applications uh, still on production. We also have an open source activity on our bitbucket.org slash Ludia account and our personal GitHub account. Eric. Hi, uh, I'm Eric. Thank you for coming. Uh, I've been doing Python for four years. Uh, I used to work on these duties, but these times I don't have so much time for uh, free stuff, uh, free software, I mean. Uh, in this talk, we'd like to share with you some opinions. It's not all about facts. Uh, we'd like to share with you what we think uh, are the best thing in pyramids, how best to use the framework, and some caveats or issues uh, we run into. It's not about comparing uh, our pointing fingers. It's just why pyramid is good. We're not going to uh, these other frameworks. I'm going to let Adrien handle the first part. We'll talk about five big things and uh, more depending on remaining time and questions. So for the first, fact, <coughs> for the first part, Adrien. So the, the first thing about Pyramid is that Pyramid framework doesn't have any opinion about the application. Uh, it lets you choose any persistence mod, uh, layer might it be SQL Alchemy, uh, if you're uh, doing uh, some SQL uh, database, or MongoKit, or uh, PyMongo, if you're doing uh, Mongo, or even let you write into files if you want to, but don't do it. Um, it lets you choose any templating system, um, and there is no specific layout required. Uh, the, the, the framework really focus on the web aspect, and really like basically handling HTTP requests and routing and dispatching. Out of the box, it provides uh, template adapters and um, also security basic classes so that you can uh, write uh, authentication based on user password or uh, signature based uh, security. It also provides hooks uh, with uh, events so that you can, uh, you can get you know, events on when the, the, the request is received or when the request has been fi uh, is finished. Let's get on, to, on an example. Can you see that? That was a question. Can you see that? <laughs> yes. So here, this is a really super simple application which can be run actually. So you, you see uh, highlighted that we define two routes, info and home, giving uh, patterns and names. And then we scan the module which permit to discover the, the, the which permit basically to, uh, to uh, discover the two function being mapped to routes thanks to the view config decorators. So in the first uh, function, get home, you see that uh, basically we return a, re a response object, which permits you to send back direct uh, HTML or text. But we advise not to doing, to doing this because it's uh, harder to test. It's better to return a dictionary. We, we use more the, the second example, which permit the, and then after had the renderer the renderer to the, uh, to the uh, view, conf view configuration. And <clears throat> basically the, the renderer here is a JSON, but you can use uh, any Mac macro file. So you, I could have put uh, info.mako, and then the templating system run, uh, process the rendering. So that here, the, as you can see, there is no, uh, I didn't, I did the, 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 out of the box, I don't have any database set, set up or 
or any uh, templating system I choose. Uh, the JSON renderer is built in. There is also the micro rend rendering adapter. But the, 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 the framework really let you focus, focuses on HTTP and let you choose what you want with the, library, the libraries you want to use. So the main problem with this is first, well, you must choose. You must choose what you want to use, and you, you have to, uh, to choose uh, the object relation mapper if you're doing some database stuff. And also, a big problem we had uh, at Ludia at the beginning is multiple teams are working on multiple projects on Pyramid, and, and they were kind of uh, doing different layouts. They were uh, organized stuff differently, and which, which, which is a headache when you switch from project to another project. So, what you also have to think uh, uh, when using Pyramid is also settle convention if you work with teams so that anyone follows the same conventions and the same way of doing things. Now the next aspect uh, we want to talk to you about is uh, for Eric. Thank you. So uh, let's dive a little deeper into root definition and view dispatch. Uh, Pyramid actually has advanced dispatch. In the simple example you saw if I have some UI pattern slash info, the request should be handled by this view function. Uh, these patterns are regular expressions. So if you have slash users slash uh, you know, a regular, a regular expression matching a name, uh, you would get it into your view. So you would be able to get the user from the DB with this name. But there are actually more things uh, you can define in your roots. If you look at a code example, Yeah, here you can see the, the highlight. I hope you can see this line and this line. Uh, we have one root. So you can see an example of the regular expression. Um, this URI uh, has two views. One view is uh, tasked with displaying the form, which replies to a GET request, and it uses a templating to make HTML form. And it's another function that actually processes the submission from this form. Um, this has the advantage of one function as one job. You don't need to put conditionals to check in the view, am I in a GET request or a POST? Or you can see sometimes some tutorials, if submit in request.post. Uh, I really think it's cleaner to have, uh, I define something that's, uh, I can edit a user. There's one view referring to GET with a template to display the form, and another view actually processes the data. Um, Sometimes it's simpler to have one view, but when you, did, uh, when you need it, you can have two views. Uh, you can also dispatch routes based on HTTP headers, or even check if I have this parameter in the query string, uh, it's another criterion, parameter uh, calls them predicate. So it's really, um, one example we have is that uh, we make pyramid, uh, Facebook application with Pyramid, and for instance, uh, in the payment system, uh, you have the same URI uh, for different things. Facebook will call your backend to get information about something people can buy. Imagine a pack of energy points. And the same URI will be called to actually process an order. And the same URI will be called with different parameters uh, to dispute an order. So what we did, uh, we implemented different routes. So here you see predicates on the view, but you can actually have predicates on the root like uh, request method or request param. So we could say, OK, logically, we have three operations. It's one URI, but we make it three routes. Then it's really simpler for the developers. I'm going to make a view config for the routes, which is supposed to describe something I'm selling. And another view and another route can handle the actual order. <laughs> These uh, different functions are also well testable. Uh, something really nifty with Pyramid. Uh, so we, we show you a view where you return a dict, and even uh, either the JSON renderer makes it um, JSON format, or the templating system makes it HTML. But if I make a unit test for this view, uh, templating is not applied. Uh, the function has written as so written returns a dict object. If I make a unit test, it's going to return a dict object. Templating. Uh, does the view config decorator does not wrap the function to apply the template it's done by pyramid in the rendering phase so it's really nifty in a unit test uh, if i have complicated logics and i want to make four tests 
for different kinds of success and errors, I can make a request object with matchdict and params to trigger some uh, specific condition, and I can make sure this exception is raised or this dictionary is returned. It's another kind of test that are, that, that are testing the full request. And another advantage is that I can have more than one view config on the same function. Uh, the case happens, and that's really practical. Um, a drawback to this approach, if we can go back to the slide. Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. Um, second example. Oh, yeah. So I told you we have predicates depending on the request, header, request method, parameters. But you can also have some predicates provided by pyramid. There is an authentication system where based on a user password or maybe a cookie or Facebook login. You can say, OK, this is a user I know, and it's an administrator. And I can define for the same route a view for regular user and a view for administrators. Because I could have just one function, get my user object, if I have one, and check, is the user admin? But I can also let Pyramid do it for me and say, this view should be dispatched to for administrators. When it's needed, uh, that's really handy. And again, maybe the first view was written first and tested and works. You write a new view. It's really about separating concerns, make it, making code clear to read and easy to test. <clears throat> so the cost of this flexibility is that uh, there's some complexity, of course. Uh, you can just s uh, make a full text search to find what's the function working for this request. Uh, you can have many different routes and views for the same patterns. And that's something to be managed. Uh, Pyramid provides a script, which is called pyroot, so that you can inspect, given a configuration, uh, what are all the patterns my replication responds to. And another thing, so the views and the routes are really flexible, but not the authentication. For one application, you have maybe, uh, you can have the cookie authentication policy. But if you, have, if you want to have some views that use uh, maybe a token, because they're not, they're not a web app for humans with a cookie, but they are a web API for a service, uh, you don't have a way to have different authentication out of the box. But you can write your own. And that's something that Adrian is going to talk about now. So Pyramid is uh, really made for extensibility and composability. Uh, you can extend the, the, configura the configurator object uh, by adding directive to it. You can also add method and attribute to the request. And basically, your configuration is composed with external dependencies and internal submodules, thanks to the include pattern. So, but I'm going to switch directly to an example. So, in terms of ex extendability, the um, we created a, a, a really tiny library we call Pyramid SQL Alchemy Utility, and which is being included here. What what it means? For, for what it means is that basically the Pyramid SQL Alchemy Utility module provides a include me method, the same as this one, which receive config as a first parameter. And this is really neat and really handy because basically you have a, a, a clear and neat interface to include different modules, different uh, dependencies. So what we do here behind under the hood into Pyramid SQL Alchemy Utility, First, when we include it, we set up the database layer, basically like the, 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 um, uh, get the, the URL and setting the session uh, class. But we also had, which is shown here, we also had a SQLA session attribute to the request. And this attribute, basically under the hood, is a lazy is open lazily a connection a session to the database. Add a hook to the, the finish call, add a hook on the request finish callback, and at the end of the request, when we finish process the request, automatically close the session so that the session go back to the pool the session pool of SQL Alchemy. This is really neat because basically, rather than having um, rather than having a global session object class which is scoped to the thread local, 
you have a session with uh, lifecycle which is map on the request lifecycle. And by the way, it is advised in the SQL Alchemy, uh, uh, SQL, SQL Alchemy documentation to do this way. So, so yeah, it's it's uh, one way, one really neat way for uh, database handling. We we did the exact same with uh, Mongo, uh, some MongoDB, in terms of getting a connect, getting a getting a session and and return, returning it to the pool. The second example is more, well. I have to tell you a story about uh, job. So it was like two years ago, we finished a big project, well, big, six months, six months game, uh, and it was really working out. And the product owner of the, of the, the game producer uh, wanted to do the exact, the exact same game, but based on another brand. And it was really the same game mechanics, kind of the same stuff, but with you know, tiny little differences. And he was in a hurry. He was like, guys, we have to do this game in less, we have to deliver it in less than th in three months. And we have, you know, just, just copy and paste and change everything, change, you know, just the tiny little differences. And of course, we didn't want to copy and paste because then after it's like you have basically two code bases which are nearly the same, but nearly not, and it's really boring to, to maintain. So basically what we did is we spent some time to just adapt the first, the first game to be includable by the second one. And what we did is really we, cre we, we create a new game, include, I have the, so we create a game, and the first include was, well, let's include the legacy application. And by doing this, we were including the whole configuration of the first game, we all the views, all the game mechanics, and then after we were able to override the tiny aspect we wanted to override, such as security, the mo adding some model and adding some and having over, we can even override views. So it was, and then after we had really a clean way of reusing a wall application, and in a hurry, and and we did it, and it worked. On the front end side, they did not choose this path; they did the copy and paste, and well, it was hell, of course. Um, just an example. Also, we we decided from this to break apart uh, basically the, the our main. The, 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 our main file is generally less than 20 lines and uh, is only composed with includes. Basically what we do is we delegate to different submodules the, uh, the, uh, the, the configuration. It's again a really neat separation of concern because it permits really to delegate the, 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 the model part to the model module. Rather than having here all the, the database setting up, we delegate this to the model. So you have an, just a quick example on the views and then on the views we can also like, we, we do the exact same job we did before in a main, adding routes and scanning. So, it's really, this aspect of Pyramid is really, really neat. This said, um, when you write Pyramid extensions, it's not you, you, WSGI middleware. It's, it's really for Pyramid, so, uh, but it's not really uh, the, that, that, that terrible. And also, by using different, by breaking apart everything, sometimes it can, it can become uh, difficult to debug, uh, to say, well, this URL is, hook, is, uh, is hooked on what views. And for this, Pyramid provides, it's, it's often, we, we don't, use, don't use it enough, to my opinion, in my opinion, uh, PRoots, PViews, and PRequests, little uh, scripts, which permits, based on, a, based on a configuration of an application, which permit to list all the routes You've been uh, you've been configuring, and yep, that's it. So I leave next part for you. Thank you. We're going to talk now about settings management. Uh, right now, you've only seen code, and uh, I want to run the app on my computer as I develop it, and I want some debug settings, and I connect my database locally. But on my stage environment, I don't want debug settings. I want some other extensions. And the database is not the same. And production is also different. So uh, I don't want to put checks in my code or to put configuration in my code. So there's one way to do it in Pyramid uh, with uh, what we call paste config file. Paste is a system to assemble uh, applications. It's from before Pyramid. It's, uh, you know, with G WSGI, it's a way to have web frameworks in Python be able to communicate with any web server in Python. And uh, you can have reusable WSGI component 
for instance, uh, to forward some headers so that the application can know the request was over HTTPS, even if the HTTPS was handled by another server. Or you can have a middleware to uh, encrypt, um, to compress your response with JZIP. So as I say, uh, you can write uh, Pyramid extensions, which take profit from Pyramid internals. But with Paste, you can also assemble your Pyramid applications, define settings, and reuse some WSGI components. Yep. So what does it look like? So that's a possible configuration file for development. It consists of two parts. First part is app main. Um, I'm telling that my application, uh, my WSGI application object is going to be provided by the main function in the example module. Uh, then we have some settings used by Pyramid uh, to enable uh, debugging. Uh, something interesting is that I can have Pyramid includes in my configuration and not in my code. In my code, I'm going to include Pyramid SQL Alchemy utility because I depend on it. I, I must include my code because I'm using request.sqlization. But this is a concern of environment. Uh, the debug toolbar is not used by my code, just something I want enabled in some context. Uh, it provides you with uh, uh, statistics uh, on your database queries, uh, routes. It's really a web, web browser-based debug toolbar with an interactive debugger, uh, <coughs> which also has, by the way, an include me. Uh, this Facebook.app ID is a setting defined by Permit Facebook, which is a free software um, uh, Permit extension that uh, we publish to make it easy to make Facebook games. And you need to put your app ID and uh, some settings in your configuration file. And last example, Maco directories uh, is a setting to let the Maco templating system know where do you find your templates. Uh, when I run locally, uh, I'm using the pserv command from Pyramid. That's why I have the second section to say my application is defined here, and I'm going to use this server. It's Ray Trust. It's a simple web server so that you can test your application locally. Uh, the configuration file is a little different for your real environments. Uh, outside of the scope of this chapter is uh, the whole system configuration management. Maybe you're using uh, a provider like Heroku. Maybe you're building your own thing on Amazon Web Services like we do. So you need to have a real web server, uh, probably Nginx, which forwards your requests to something like UWSGI or GUnicorn. And then these things are Python WSGI servers. They use your configuration file to find your application. Yeah. So this is an example for stage. We don't have the server section because that's something else. We have the same entry point to tell, to tell UWSGI that's the function that's going to return my application. We're going to see it just after. I have all the debugs to false. I don't have debug toolbar, but I have pyramid X log. That's another nifty extension that uh, is going to send uh, uncaught exceptions to the Python logging system but they are not lost in the console or to dev null somewhere else. And you see, for instance, SQL Alchemy can also take configuration from this. So you're going to have uh, one config file for test, another one for stage, another one for production. Uh, we actually use a templating system for these config files because we don't want to forget that uh, this, would, this, this would avoid uh, our server's uh, leak memory or something. So if we test a setting on stage, we want the same on production. So we actually have a template for config files, different settings for each environment, and then we generate the file from the settings. Uh, if we look at the second, the second, second part of it is the code. So I define, oh uh, yeah, so you need to put some boilerplate in your setup.ty script. You can just accept it and ignore it. And in the end, the main function is change a little. Uh, so that's the main function defined as entry point in my config file. I get a global config object that I ignore, and the settings, the, the dictionary, dictionary here, is actually the app main section. So here I can get sqlalchemy.pullrecycle, I can get debug, I can get my code directory. And then I include my models, they can get from the settings uh, database information. Or if I include parent Facebook, it's going to have access in settings to uh, Facebook.app ID. So in summary, uh, it's really a, you have simple configuration in your config file. 
you have this main entry point in your code, and it's quite easy. Uh, something we've changed our mind on recently, uh, we, we, we had the tendency to put everything in the config files, because it's really practical. You can put your uh, database connection string in there, sometimes including passwords, and SQL Alchemy will find it. But uh, it turned out it's not a good idea to put secrets on the config files, and also uh, the settings should contain the application settings. Uh, this is about environment settings, and we have other systems so that if we provision a database for this server, we can inject it to the environment, the correct uh, environment variable um, to configure the, to define the database connection string. That's something very similar to what Heroku does, and I think for the same reasons. Um, this system uses paste, which I mentioned, and sometimes paste has issues. It's a little old, it's a little complex with three different Python packages depending on each other. Uh, at one point, we could not install with pip. Uh, we, we needed to use easy install. So that happens. Uh, it's not strictly required. You could have another way to plug your uh, Pyramid application into your server, but it's really convenient. And uh, Pyramid could do without it, but uh, it really works well to solve the problem having different settings for different environments. <coughs> for the last part, uh, I'm going to uh, tell you about a quite unique Pyramid feature, which is called Traversal. Um, Traversal is a way uh, to have, um, so basically in a web framework, in your application, you have some requests coming for some URIs, and you want functions to be invoked. Uh, all the examples we've shown you before use URL dispatch. From a, reg a regular expression, you match some root, and then you dispatch to some view. With Traversal, it's really different. Uh, if you think about it, when you have applications, you have a forum, and the resources, the URIs, you have like forum, then you have a thread, you may have a message, and in what we do, like backend services, it's machines talking to machines, it's really a tree of resources. Uh, you know the buzzword RESTful, or um, it's also called uh, resource-oriented architecture, that's a term from the book RESTful Web Services, that's something that has a lot of benefits and we chose to implement. And you think about your application as, okay, I'm going to have users as a collection, and I have one user resource, a user resource as messages, and so on. It's always a tree. And Traversal is a way to code this tree. It's not just an abstraction of documentation. It's actually how you write it. Um, we look at a few slides of code, because it's really uh, unusual. So Traversal starts with a root factory. Um, this object is going to represent uh, what's the resource at slash. So we don't have roots at all, but we're saying to Pyramid, hey, when a request comes, first you instantiate this object. And then you call it getItem method. It's like dictionary access with the first segment of the path. If I have slash users, slash one, two, three, slash messages, first I instantiate root and I pass the first segment users to the get item. And here you can see if I have users, traversal continues, and another object will be traversed with the user ID. But if I have something else than users, raising a key error lets Pyramid return a 404 not found uh, status. And traversal can continue as long as you have path segments, you traverse the objects you get from the get items. So you can imagine your UI slash user slash one two three. And here it's actually root object brackets user brackets one two three. And if I raise a key error, traversal stops and we go into view dispatch. Or if I don't have path segments uh, anymore, that's my resource and I'm going to view dispatch. Yes, please. So. Um, can you go back, actually, to the example of uh, many routes? In the um, previous one? Yeah. Here you see we repeat ourselves all the time in our patterns. Uh, here, that's a simple validator to mean that my user ID should be uh, int, so that in my view, if I need to convert this part of the UI into int, I don't have to catch the value error, because Pyramid will make sure for me it's a valid uh, number. But I'm going to repeat the same things all the time. And when it's very deep, I need to find names for the roots, and I repeat the same things all the time. 
or you can have some uh, helper libraries to generate from. Uh, you avoid that entirely with traversal. Each segment is used only once, and it's really nifty. Um, we can look quickly. Yeah. Um, this class is the resource uh, that is uh, match, uh, traversed for slash users. And it returns another uh, object for slash users and with an ID or name. And it's, it's really not the model. The model is the persistence and the logic. And traversal is only the logical tree of your resources. For instance, here from my database, maybe user is known. But I'm just saying that slash user slash name is valid. And it lets me have a view to do a get. And it should return 404. Or I can have a view to do a put. That's the next slide. So I recognize view config. We don't have root name. We have context. Uh, that's the name of a resource class. And um, so the life cycle here is pyramid traverses the URI. So you end up with a user resource object. And then we match into this view. And we can actually uh, make a put. Um, Uh, so that's really powerful because if you think about resources like we do in uh, RESTful uh, churches, uh, what you think about is what you code. It's a one-one mapping. You really write the resources, collection and resources. Um, second, it's really easy to have get, put, patch, delete when it makes sense. Then you take advantage of the architecture of HTTP. You can also, for each resource, define fine-grained access control list. You can say everybody can get these objects, but only the user 123 can access the user data 123, and only an admin can put it. Uh, thanks to the resources, you can really define uh, fine-grained authorizations. And we find it's actually quite clear to use. Uh, you could compose uh, resources subtrees together, and uh, it's a really uh, cool model. Uh, the problem is that, of course, we talked about the peer-root script. If you include five different projects with peer roots, you can make sure the view, the roots patterns are what you think. Are what you think. Here, you don't have root patterns at all. So you can't generate a tree of possible URIs. And also, uh, it's a little more complicated and less commonly known. So you need some time to understand it. And you have to make choices all the time. So the thing uh, we've done, we extract it from uh, a few projects using traversal, the common needs, common problems. We decided on some conventions. And uh, Adrian is going to uh, present at a lightning talk tomorrow a, a library called Pyramid Royal uh, to have conventions for, uh, and uh, to reduce the boilerplate. If you look back at the example in the video or the slides, uh, the init method are nearly all the same. The get item methods are nearly always the same. So we want to provide helpers working with Pyramid to make it easier to define uh, RESTful APIs using Traversal. It's really powerful, and you would like it. So in conclusion, um, to, to tell about our story, well, it's been now four years. That at the really beginning, we switched uh, from Pylons to Pyramid. And um, I have to say that, it, of course, we have some pain. We had some painful moment uh, because of having uh, any file becoming too big. But at the end, it's uh, all developers are really happy, and uh, there's a lot of joy in uh, their hearts. And um, it's it's I, I especially really like the separation of concern. Uh, that pyramid permits you to do uh, really like separate the need and having uh, we we oftenly say well you have really one contract for this view and you have a, a, another one for this one rather than having into one view like uh, different cases being uh, processed. Uh, we did not mention uh, documentation, the event system, how do you sell pyramid to your boss, uh, how do you advance authentication, or what's the community like. So yeah. if you have ideas for questions, you can ask about these topics or whatever you would like to ask. Thank you. All right, so we have a few moments for questions. If, yeah. Uh, two questions, actually. Um, the first is, 
how well does it run on App Engine, or is, is there a community around that? And second was is um, you mentioned about the uh, the config file being templatized. Um, I haven't seen that done before, so if there's an example somewhere that I can take a look at, or if you can expound on that a little bit more, that'd be great. Maybe you can let some Pyramid members. We have some core developers here, I think, about the yeah. They were checking if we were not saying uh, mistakes. Um, there are actually a number of scaffolds, which is basically if you want to generate a project that's completely hooked up to um, App Engine. Um, and Tom Willis, I think he's not here. There's a few people who do this, and you can just basically pip install them, run a project, it'll work. I mean, it supports whatever App Engine supports, so there's a few. As far as I know, there's at least a couple of applications that use it. So you can pretty much do it. And second question, we just have a simple script that has uh, a template in a file with uh, placeholders and another file with uh, these are the values we want for different environments. So for instance, we have the basic skeleton of the config file with facebook.appid equals placeholder. Then in another file, we have production, app ID is whatever. And then a simple script uh, using Mako, it's like 10 lines, uh, mixes the template with the settings to produce five files. It's in-house and it's uh, make sure we don't forget a setting between environments. I saw another one there, yeah. You could also use heritage between config files, but that can be uh, messy. So for the video, there is mr.bob, which is another project that's uh, written to handle that. Um, have you dealt with multilingual dispatching? And uh, do you have any tricks about for that? Or Can you explain what you mean with multilevel dispatch? Multilingual routing. Oh, uh, we um. haven't had the need yet. But out of the box, uh, you can have as a request predicate uh, accept language. So you could have different views for different languages. Or more interesting, there is built-in uh, localization support in Pyramid, so that depending on a cookie preferences set in the DB or uh, whatever settings, uh, you can return different text. But we don't have, uh, we haven't had the need yet. Another question? All right. Thank you. Thank you.